Welcome everyone to this year's Global Plant Forward Culinary Summit Virtual Edition. I'm Jacqueline Chi, Director of Programs and Special Projects for the Strategic Initiatives Group at the Culinary Institute of America. On behalf of everyone at the college, it is a pleasure to have you joining us from all over the country and the world for this third edition of the summit. By the end of this week, we will have hosted this summit virtually more times than we have in person. Another sobering reminder of how the coronavirus pandemic has upended our daily and personal lives, as well as the industry that we work in over the past year. Indeed, across the CIA's portfolio of industry leadership programs, Global Plant Forward was the first summit that we adapted for a virtual model back in May of 2020. And while vaccines are rolling out in increased numbers, we are still ways from business as usual, whatever that may mean in a post-pandemic world. So in the meantime, we have built an incredibly robust online conference experience for you, one in which we are privileged to have top chefs and experts joining us from around the world, giving us glimpses into their own operations and research, all within a platform that allows each of you to directly engage with each other with the aim of building a community of peers and practitioners who are collectively working towards advancing plant forward principles throughout the food service industry. In fact, to aid in building this community, we'd love for everyone to take a moment uh, to introduce themselves in the summit chat. Let us know who you are and where you are joining us from. And don't worry, you can do all of this while still staying in your sweatpants if you prefer. This is thanks in no small part to the generosity of our program sponsors whose support is helping us make this year's summit to culinary professionals tuition free. I hope you'll take some time over the next few days to meet them, especially during the networking times and in the Innovation Hub, and let them know how much we appreciate their support of this vital industry gathering. I'm going to do my part right now and say thank you to Unilever Food Solutions, our platinum sponsor, and our premium gold sponsors, National Peanut Board and Oatly. Thank you also to our gold sponsor, Food at Google, as well as our bronze sponsors, Lentils.org, New Wave Foods, Nestle Professional, North Harvest Bean Growers Association, and the Mushroom Council. And we are incredibly grateful for our supporting corporate and media sponsors. Now, let's jump into the summit by welcoming Greg Drescher, Vice President of Strategic Initiatives and Industry Leadership at the CIA, to talk to us about why Plant Forward still matters. Hi, Greg. Hi, Jackie, and thanks, uh, thanks uh, to you, and welcome everyone. Well, it's been a it's been a tough year, and for many uh, a devastating year. But even as we anticipate the end of this pandemic and lean into rebuilding our industry, we know that other serious challenges haven't gone away while we've been struggling with this virus. Two years ago, some of you uh, joined us at our CIA at Copia campus here in the Napa Valley when we launched our annual Global Plant Forward Culinary Summit. Then as now, our focus for this initiative is to double down on culinary strategy in order to better address issues ranging from climate change and other sustainability concerns to obesity and a host of diet-related chronic disease trends laid bare by this pandemic. Nine years ago, the CIA and the Harvard School of Public Health jointly launched our Menus of Change initiative to develop action strategies at the convergence of health and environmental imperatives, culinary innovation, and business insight. This Global Plant Forward Culinary Summit builds on the work of Menus of Change. At the core of Menus of Change is a set of guiding principles to inform and inspire new directions in our industry. You can view this infographic at our website, menusofchange.org, where you can also download other project resources. A number of recent scientific reports have concluded that as we approach a planet with 9 to 10 billion people by 2050, our goal must be to achieve healthy diets for all from sustainable food systems and within planetary boundaries. Reflecting this, one key menus of change principle highlights the need to reduce foods from animal sources, including especially red meat consumption. In addition to concerns about chronic disease prevention, there are vital issues at stake here for the health of the planet. We do not need to eliminate red meat and other animal-based proteins from our diet if one relishes meat, for example, but rather substantially reduce their use. This in turn has informed our framing of plant forward, which we define as a style of cooking and eating that emphasizes and celebrates, but is not limited to plant-based foods. 
The result is a, a big tent approach that, em that embraces vegetarian and vegan options, but also the larger opportunity around a healthy flexitarian approach to eating and menu design. We use the term plant forward as opposed to plant-based to help us move beyond the on-off or regular versus vegetarian or vegan choice architecture that historically has constrained menu innovation. It's important to emphasize here that by using the term plant forward, we mean to imply whole, slow metabolizing, minimally processed foods, not say chips and soda, which are also derived from plants. In the spring of last year, we released Plant Forward by the Numbers, which makes the business case for adopting this strategy. And then uh, the CI teamed up with Data Central to check in with consumers on whether this Plant Forward megatrend was persisting during the pandemic. Plant Forward opportunity not only includes some very positive news on this trend, but also insights on how to turn aspiration into yet more change in purchase behavior. This slide drawn from those reports illustrates that although vegetarian preferences are growing in the United States, the far larger market is the 39% of Americans who say they are trying to eat more plant-based foods and the 44% of consumers who are seeking to reduce their meat consumption. And interestingly, Data Central also found that 80% of consumers are at least open to exploring menu directions less dependent on meat. Then to highlight who is successfully leading innovation around this consumer trend, we teamed up with QSR to produce the Plant Forward Fast Casual Watch List. And that was followed by the Plant Forward Full Service Watch List in collaboration with FSR. You can view all of these resources at our Plant Forward Kitchen website. Now let's turn to culinary strategy, which we think is key to driving change in this area. One of the strategies we're advancing is the concept of the protein flip. That is moving meat off the center of the plate and making it more of a supporting or occasional element of the meal or even a condiment. Our work around the blended burger is one example of that, where a mixture of ground mushrooms replaces 30% or more of the meat. If even this modest change were to become the default in American burger purchasing, you can see the environmental impacts would be significant. The plant forward concept becomes especially appealing when viewed within the context of world food cultures. For the last 22 years, the CI has been staging its influential Worlds of Flavor International Conference and Festival, which has brought in talent from a broad range of food cultures. For generations in many cultures, home cooks uh, have used brilliant flavor strategies to increase the appeal of plant-sourced foods. This work has informed our view of the diversity of food, world food cultures and flavor discovery as a compelling framework in which to advance health and sustainability imperatives. But of course, we can look much closer to home for inspiration, including from American chefs, such as Amanda Cohen from Dirt Candy in New York, who we'll be hearing from in later in today's program. All of this has inspired a major CIA project, a digital media-based plant-forward kitchen certification program, which is now in development with our partners at Google. More details are coming uh, soon on that. And finally, I leave you with this summary call to action to relentlessly pursue deliciousness at the intersection of health, sustainability, culture, and innovation. And with that brief background, it's now my great pleasure to introduce Joe Yonan, who will get us started with our first general session. Joe is the food and dining editor at the Washington Post, where he also writes a vegetarian column. His books include Eat Your Vegetables and the most recent Cool Beans. And by the way, Joe will be doing a Meet the Author session later in today's program. Joe also wrote this piece in the post a couple of years back about the release of the CIA's Plant Forward Global 50 watch list, which you can view at plantforward50.com. Welcome, Joe. Thank you so much, Greg. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I'm very excited to be here. This is a subject that is near and dear to my heart um, as someone who eats a, a plant-based diet and um, just am in such awe and support of, of the work that the CIA has done to get chefs around the country and the world to embrace plant-forward cooking. So thank you very much for including me. I am very excited to introduce um, the first chef that I'm going to be um, in conversation with. Um, she is Narda Lepes, and many of you probably know the name. She's a food activist and the chef owner at Narda Comador in Buenos Aires. 
and she's host of MasterChef Argentina and a TV producer of other programs. And in just in 2020, she was named Best Female Chef in Latin America by World's 50 Best, um, a title that I want to compliment her on and also challenge World's 50 to say that I, I bet she's probably one of the world's best chefs no matter what gender we're talking about. So um, Narda, I'm very um, excited to, to talk to you today. Thank you very much, Joe. And thanks to the CIA for this opportunity to practice my, sec my English and try to <laughs> display a little bit of what we do in Argentina, uh, which we've been talking about. Um, I love that it's plant forward and not plant based because I think the, the market tends to co up um, uh, words like sustainable mm -hmm. makes little sense or gourmet or premium or whatever. It stops making the same sense for everyone. So I think plant, plant forward is more um, truthful to what we want to eat. And mm -hmm. when I say we, we, we talk about this a little bit the other day as a hundred percent of, of people that goes to restaurants, you have 5% that is like carnivore. I want my meat. Like it's a lot of Argentinians. And then you have a 5% that is like, I'm vegan. This is my life. And this is the way I want to live it. But most of us live in the other 90%. So what we try to do at the restaurant at Comedor is to focus on the, the, that 90% and make an experience that is enjoyable for them of discovery and not not a lecture on them not never to lecture on the on the people that comes to the restaurant that that's a very sp specific thing that we do then we don't tell you like two minutes on each plate or the, the if it's local if it's not we know we do it if it, people ask we tell them but you come to a restaurant and just have a nice time it's a very relaxing um, environment you, we have uh, we have people that save money to come to a restaurant and people that mm -hmm. lives in the most expensive buildings that are just in front of us. Mm -hmm. So our audience is very broad. Um, so when we think about the menu, uh, we thought about a space that will be welcoming and will be very inclusive to everyone. Um, either if you eat meat or not, if you're vegetarian or not. But we want you to forget about that and just mm -hmm. eat because it's good and then realize that you maybe haven't eaten a muscle in the whole <laughs> meal. But afterwards that. We have a little uh, video that we can show to Great. show the restaurant and we can keep our conversation. And so the, the commercial part was very important for us. Um, so we try to we try to to have a, 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 a to have a, a scenario of what we deal with in Argentina. It's our meat consumption consumption last year was fifty kilos per person. Oh wow! Yeah, in wow. the eighties. Yeah, in the eighties <laughs> was eighty kilos. Wow. But, okay. Yeah, but that is not all. That a lot of people stop eating meat. It's economic reasons. It's we, we sell a lot of our meat abroad. We send it to another countries. So it's not all uh, we're eating less meat because we want to. But it's, it's a little trend, at least a little bit less meat. Mm -hmm. So we use a lot of, we, we center a lot of, on weight because everything is related. Waste is related. Uh, sustainability is related. Water supply is related to everything. So we try to be as conscious as we can, but not lecturing anybody. Mm -hmm. So we work a lot with fat, bones, uh, anchovies or concentrated umami flavors that come from animals. Mm -hmm. And we, we spend a lot of time on those. And when we think about our audience, as I always think about the dad dishes that we should have, <laughs> that we always have in our menu, a uh, ribeye, mm -hmm. that never comes with potatoes or wheat or anything that is simple to the eye. It comes with whole vegetables that are the misfits of the season. 
Oh, great. It's maybe cabbage or turnips or daikon or has to be a misfit for the, not for cooks because we love them, but, <laughs> but we do that uh, for, for the common imaginary cabbage is not a, it's not king. So mm -hmm. maybe a right. potato could be, or a sweet potato is great, whatever. So we try to have that and aburrata, that it's something that you hear and say, okay, I'm safe. I can, because we don't explain the dishes a lot in the names, we just suggest them, the, the, the waiters suggest. We need a lot of work with waiters when we, when we offer the menu. So the, the menu has a structure that has those anchors for that dishes uh, or safe. <laughs> Or the mm -hmm. one that is, oh, they brought me here, <laughs> right. and I didn't want to. And, okay. I'm gonna leave. I'm gonna leave hungry. I'm gonna yeah. right. We're gonna have to stop yeah. at a steakhouse on the way home, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so those are for the ones that are um, restless uh, about the, the menu, mm -hmm. and then we have a very a menu that is very structured seasonally. Mm. We always have whole vegetables on the on the menu because I want it because there's a lot of dishes, small, medium, big, but I want it. We wanted you to see the whole vegetables on the table, and when you leave, you said you can say I eat half a akusai, a, a Chinese cabbage. I eat a whole aubergine. I eat three tomatoes. One you can see what you had. It's not yeah. covered. That, that happened with the tofu also, that we have a tofu dish that I wanted you to see that you're eating raw, fresh, simple tofu with a lot of flavors on top, but I, I that's didn't want to cover that, it up. Um, yeah. That's the and one that we saw. saw in the video, right? Yeah. yeah. And there you have the origin that is whole, you can see it. It's sort of a mix of a, a parmesan, but you can see the origin. It's not like mm -hmm. a, that you don't see it. And we we try to have a balance in in the menu that has to has that solid structure that it's personal taste like the tofu that it's my challenge that you're gonna eat that <laughs> tofu even though you think you don't like it but you will because you don't have to hide tofu you have to surround it with strong partners right. to make it work right um, and then. Uh, those two anchors, they change seasonally, as I say, like the the, the misfits, those those dish, those vegetables that I don't. And the meat that we use, meat, chicken or whatever, it's only that we know the source and we know what it has eaten. But we don't tell you about it because if we tell you a lot of that, it will make you feel bad about your choices. Uh. So we don't lecture. We know what we do, and if you ask, we tell you. That's a very strong thing that we do every every time. Uh, and we bet on flavor and performance. Every mm -hmm. dish passes two tests. That is flavor. If it's balanced, if it tastes is good, if if it's enhanced by by the crunchiness and the texture and everything, and then how it performs on the table. One of the tests is. If, if the sauce is enough, if you understand what you're gonna do with it when it comes to the table. Because one of the things that I find really, really sad is when my sauce is not enough for whatever I'm eating or- Oh, uh, right, yeah. So if it doesn't perform well for the, for the customer, it doesn't work. And the other one is how it sits on you. So oh, how we it all- you feel? Yeah. Mm. Because I think the meal doesn't end when you leave the restaurant. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think if you work as a journalist and ask cooks that we go and eat a lot of degustation menus and we mm. try different things, you'll feel like bad a lot yeah. of the time. So a lot of fermentation, a lot of mix. So we try to make it pass and we eat it with a, with a mix of other dishes so it doesn't we don't, don't have any troubles i don't want to be right too graphic, okay right right so, so that is a test yes you do sometimes yeah. think sometimes when you eat those menus you wonder if the chef sat down and ate the whole thing and it sounds like you do yeah. try you you and your staff try eating the whole menu 
Yeah, and we do, once in a while, we see it in the, the table that is as far as away from the kitchen as possible. Mm. We see it four or five people from the staff and have it all. That's like, great. Yeah, have it all. Because you will understand if you... My God, one thing that, that cooks do, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, don't worry. <laughs> one, <the> video. <laughs> one thing that a lot of uh, cooks do is to, like, don't want to put too much of that sauce because I'll have to make more. Mm. But sometimes one spoon less means, means that the whole dish doesn't work. Right. So looks and how it, the, the aesthetic of the dish is absolutely second or third in our list. Mm -hmm. Then we'll see how to make it work. We have the ones that are great decorators and he said, okay, mm -hmm. this is how much this should have and this should be in touch with this. Then do your thing. Make it pretty. But oh, with oh, this proportion. And that yeah. is impossible to make pretty, but it's very, very good. And it we don't pretty, say pretty what it me. is. <laughs> it's a pecorino meringue. Mm. Uh, a pecorino cheese meringue with a, with a um, cheese uh, ice cream, cream mm. and preserved figs and fresh figs. And mm. everything has to be like a mess. And that's the deal with it. Uh, we also have w one of the other challenges that we have is where to get the ideas from. So, mm. because we see in young cooks, sometimes it's hard for them to incorporate, they wanna do what they see on Instagram. Mm -hmm. So we have some <laughs> rules. We have some rules. If we've seen it enough, we, we won't do it. We don't uh, do- What are some of those? A buns, like uh, the, the buns. Like, Oh, Momofuku uh -huh. buns, we won't do the them. The steamed buns, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. the steamed buns, we won't do them. Or hummus, uh, beetroot hummus, we won't right. do it. We <laughs> right. try to keep, stay away from that uh, a little bit because we'll make them think. Sometimes they get frustrated because they want to do that. Now we have this formula everywhere that is something creamy on, on, mm -hmm. on the bottom, a vegetable on top and crunchy things. Uh -huh. And not always mm -hmm. that makes a dish. Mm -hmm. It looks nice feels like, like it's right, but you had to work a lot to make one of those a great dish. Mm -hmm. So we try to stay away from that kind of solution. And, and we don't do replacements like oh, right. cauliflower, pizza, or um, mm -hmm. we don't do that because I think you don't have to, my way of thinking is that you will always think of the other one. <laughs> Right, yeah, like the yeah. like the zucchini noodles or yeah. the right, right. We did a carbonara dish that was half of the dish was capellini, mm -hmm. um, which is lovely and and fun to have in your mouth, mm -hmm. and the other fifty percent was asparagus uh, shapes oh, and, fun. and zucchini, and you have the pancetta and you have the the, the, the um, how, uh, well not the pancetta the, the this oh, one. the um, guanciale. Guanciale. Yes. And I was poking my <laughs> own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the guanciale. And you have everything that it has, but 50% of the dish. If we're going to do something, we call it like trashy. 50% of it has to be vegetable. We can do anything, but 50% right. of it, we have to manage and think and be creative to make it a vegetable dish. Even it, sometimes we do, a, we do a, a poutine, which is really trashy. Right. <laughs> but, but we did it with a lot of mushrooms, like a oh, lot great. of mushrooms and different mushrooms and only a seasonal, like a two weeks dish. Right. And then no waste is another firm thing. So that's mm -hmm. another creative uh, challenge for us. And one thing that we try to think and look back, that we go way back looking for recipes, is that sometimes creativity is in scarcity, like we see in oh, the yes. great kitchens of the European or, or the Jewish, the Italian. Mm -hmm. uh, in scarcity, you have mm -hmm. a, a great source of creativity, but also when you have a disproportionate abundance of one thing, which uh. is harvest food. And you have harvest. to figure out what the heck am I going to do with all okay, of this? Okay, I have a room. Yeah, right. I have a room filled with cauliflower. What right. should I do? <laughs> right. So there, sometimes we buy like a whole bucket, or or, or we call up a producer and said, "How much do you have?" And we buy it all and we divide it between two or three restaurants. 
collaboration is very interesting also working with other restaurants and share because when you buy from one producer that makes very very good thing if you buy them everything in one two three shots you change their economy much mm. more than mm -hmm. if you do it like bit by bit Mm -hmm. So we try to make like big purchases and divide it and we are faced with, okay, we have to do like a lot of dishes with right. this. Right. And sometimes are harvest dishes and you have to make a lot of research uh, to find those dishes, mm -hmm. which usually are near, you have to learn a little bit about geography that cooks don't like to uh -huh. <laughs> in the beginning, a little bit of history. So I try to do that part to encourage them to do some research. And before going forward, you have to go back and right. way back. Right. Um, Chef, there's there's a couple of audience questions I wanted to ask okay. you, at least one of them. Um, someone asked about wine pairing, which I think is a fascinating question. So how has wine pairing changed in your restaurant with more plant forward dishes, you know, especially with such a strong tradition in Argentina of both meat and the winemaking? Is there a is there a way that you've thought about it differently? The the usual joke was like asparagus and artichokes and <laughs> eggs were like a mess for them. Right. But <laughs> but luckily the consumer change and the wines change for mm, us. We're not only wines change a lot. We have the old school, the the, the a lot of tana taninos and, and the Malbecs and the, the cabernets and all that that we're known for were very mm -hmm. known for yes. and they pair very well with meat and whatever but now we have all the natural wines uh, mm. that you gotta open and serve them <laughs> so <laughs> it, you don't you don't keep them as much and we have these wines that are more maybe not on the natural branch of it but that are more related to the ground and and to the soil with that change them a lot so that came with a new change and it's an open mind because I think pairing was like a, a very, very by the book and only mm -hmm. by the book. Mm -hmm. And what I try to do is not read, not reading those books and try to <laughs> trust my mouth. I love it. <laughs> I trust, I trust what I feel. You, you in, trust your palate. I trust, I train my palate uh, for mm -hmm. years. I'm, I'm almost 50 years old. So I train my palate a lot. So I try to go through that and and the consumer is changing is open to try different i don't like a lot of the new wines like mm -hmm. the vinegar ones or the, the the ones that taste like sherry i think they're very hard to match mm. but sometimes people eat sushi with red wine so right right is there so so Greg has a great question, um, which sort of cuts to a lot of uh, what we're talking about here. And that is, if you could serve just one dish on your menu to one of those confirmed carnivores to entice them into this world of vegetables and plant, yeah. plant I will describe foods, it. what would it be? What would that dish be? We do a very, very concentrated juice of, of the bones of, the best meat we can find. Mm -hmm. And we braise an onion in whey, whey milk whey, whey. Mm -hmm. whey. We braise it and then we finish it in, in that juice and we make a almost 50-50 potato butter puree. Oh, yeah. <laughs> almost 50-50. <laughs> and we put a lot of pine nuts and hazelnuts and fresh herbs and onion flowers on top of it and you eat it with a spoon and you don't miss the muscle, but you have all the flavors and maybe you can have that and a few more dishes and you won't miss the you muscle. Got it. Yeah. You've got it. That was the dish that we saw at the beginning of the yeah. video, right? The one that you call everything but the meat. Yeah, and you're, yeah that's so great. Um, so another question that we got um, from the audience was about pricing. Um, yeah. Do you find resistance to people paying more for plant forward dishes and how do you, how do you approach that? You, you gotta be smart now, not only talking about the way people see it, but everyone that serves 
fried potatoes, though, that you make money out of fried potatoes and coffee and mm. booze. But, right. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but you, if you work seasonally and you plan it very well, you can have like a nice balance because you, you will have dishes that are very beautiful, like the cabbage that the Japanese cabbage that we have, that it's a quarter of a cabbage on a plate with a lot of flavors on it and beautiful flowers, has a lot of, um, takes a little while to serve for them, mm -hmm. but it's very cheap to, to do. And people love it and they love having it on the table. They love right. watching it and they mm. try it and they, and they see, I want that because they mm. saw it. And sometimes the other dishes that take a long time, mm. like the, the everything but the meat, uh, they're expensive to make mm -hmm. because they take a lot of working hours out of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the price is hidden and sometimes the value, um, it's on the covers. So we try to make a balance and we try to be very smart uh, doing, uh, I have a very, um, I have a head chef that he's a, his father and mother an accountant. So it's great. Oh, isn't that because He's very smart doing the, <laughs> wow. all the costs. That I, that I, 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 I'm, I'm good estimating, mm -hmm. I'm very good estimating, but he's very sharp with them. So we are a good team. I love that. I love that. That's fantastic. Well, you know, Chef, I think the only frustration that any of us are having, and I'll speak to myself, um, speak for myself, is that I'm not there tasting this food with you and eating at your restaurant. I cannot wait. I'm sure you've you've enticed a lot more people to check out um, what you're doing. So thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Really. Thank, really thank you very much. It. And thanks to everyone. And uh, the recipes are available, available for everyone to download and try them at home. Thank you. Great. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so now we're going to, because of the beauties of, of our um, virtual set up here. We're going to swing over to Australia and we're going to talk to Blaine Bertoncello and he is the co-owner with his brother and he is the head chef and farmer at Oh My uh, restaurant in Beaconsville, Beaconsfield, excuse me, Australia in the suburbs of Melbourne. And it, it has a focus on farm first, minimal waste dining and they grow 98% of the food that they serve. And he owns it with his brother, Chase, the sommelier. And before we hear from Blaine, um, we're going to see his a video that he shared with us where he's gonna show us um, a couple of dish dishes. Hi, my name is Blaine Vincello from Oh My in Beaconsfield, Australia. Um, I'm gonna show you a couple of recipes. Okay, so the first recipe we're gonna show you is our zucchini. Uh, which has been sort of dressed with chicken. What we do here is we use all the different varieties and styles of zucchini and um, all the offcuts and secondary items of the chicken. So uh, for instance, here we've got the chicken jus, which is made from the bones. Um, it's a chicken stock that's been reduced for a really long time. This is the chicken fat, which is actually uh, the leftover from the chicken stock that usually gets thrown out. Uh, the chicken skin, which uh, we get for free from the butcher across the road because they can't use it. Uh, so we actually dehydrate that and fry it uh, into a nice little crumble. Uh, this here is the marinated zucchini. So this is actually a pickled zucchini. So we slice these down as a preserving method through the years. Um, this is some fresh zucchini as well to sort of balance it all out. And these are some of the salad greens that we add to it. Some fresh dill seed, uh, bean flowers, and some salty ice plant. So first of all, we skewer the blanched zucchinis and the marinated zucchinis really simply like this. And uh, until we end up with the final product, we do. Yeah. Before we grill it, we just glaze it with a little bit of chicken fat. now it's come off the grill after a couple of minutes um, on both sides and it's nice and crispy on top so what we're gonna do now is actually plate it so we simply slide it off the skewer onto the plate and press it together 
Now we're going to be putting the chicken dew over the top, just a simple little glaze like this. Now we're going to sprinkle some fresh dill seed over the top, which will give the dish a really nice aromatic feel. After that, we're going to have some of the fried chicken skin, which has been uh, a little bit salted as well, which is just literally to season the dish. Following up with some salty ice plant, which gives the dish a little bit of acidity. And then we're going to finish it with some fresh bean flowers, which are delicious this time of the year. It's kind of like having a, a little sweet bean. And this is our dish of zucchini and chicken. So with this dish, we're going to show you the variations of tomato, calamari, and the allium family, which is the onion, garlic, and, and uh, that, that family. First of all, we're going to uh, plate this dish with the fresh tomatoes from the farm. So these are just uh, some of the varieties we grow. We actually grow about sort of 12 to 15 different varieties each year. But uh, we have a simple rule with tomatoes. We don't actually refrigerate them at all. We feel like that takes away all the flavour. Um, so these are just fresh and they've been uh, ripened slowly um, during in the sun. And then we serve them at room temperature always to make sure you get the actual flavour of them coming straight off the farm. Next up, we're gonna put the uh, blanched garlic, which this has been blanched about 10 times. So first we blanch it, then we peel it, and then we, uh, we cook it about 10 times to take away the strong sort of flavour of garlic, so it's a little bit sweeter. And then to go with this as well, we've got the pickled shallots. So these just give the dish the acidity it needs. We're also gonna be putting some of the fresh squid which has been frozen to tenderize it. And then we've just diced it into nice little one centimeter cubes. Um, over the top is a bit of a dressing. We actually make green garlic oil. So this is made out of all the green garlic leaves at the farm that we've just blitzed with oil at about 70 degrees to take all the flavor out. We garnish this with some of the um, allium flowers that we have at the farm. We actually grow about five different varieties of, of onion flowers or garlic flowers. So these ones here are Purple Society and the White Chive to give the dish a nice little spicy kick. So as important with everything we do here at Omai, we uh, try to use the whole entire product and what we've done here is using all the squid heads and tentacles and, and all the offcuts and made a squid stock. Um, it's just been simmered with onions and a little bit of white wine. Uh, we actually finished the dish with this. Um, and this is our dish of squid, tomato and allium. Chef, that looks incredible. Um, really appreciate it. That's so beautiful. Can I clarify a couple of quick things with you that I wonder if the audience might be, might have been wondering? I didn't yes. quite understand the the little leafy green that you put on. You called it. Okay, I'm gonna totally butcher this, but what yes. I heard was salty ice plant. Yeah, <laughs> is that salty right? Is that what it's called? Exactly right. Yeah, salty ice plant. What is that? Yeah, so that's actually uh, sort of a, a weird and wonderful little plant we grow at the farm. It's a desert plant. It's a, It has little icicles on it. It sort of looks oh. like a – it's kind of, yeah, very unique. You can look it up on the internet and you'll you'll see little photos of it, but it's quite tough to grow as well. We found little sandy patches all around our farm to grow it, and you don't even water it. You just let it go, and it reseeds wow. itself each, each year, and it's beautiful. It's got a really – it has a little kick of acid, but it's sort of weird and we weird flavored, but but delicious. So great, great. <laughs> oh, thank things. you. <laughs> That's so interesting. Um, the other thing that I just was that I that was striking me a little bit. So the squid for the dice was yep. that it's just it's frozen but not cooked. Is that right? Yeah. So, oh, so cool. we get we get super fresh squid, um, squid like um, from Corner Inlet, which is only about an hour away from where we are. Um, and it gets caught. The guy on the boat calls me on the boat, the fisherman, and he he tells me what he's got, and then sends it straight down. So I'm getting super fresh squid, and just uh, cleaning it up, and 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 then just freezing it, the the the, the tender parts, and then dicing them, and then warming them up in the broth is probably the best way to eat it. You know, in a lot of ways, when it's so fresh, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some, That's amazing. sometimes it's best to just slice it and not even freeze it. You know, you just eat it straight up as it is. You know, right, there's, right. There's no reason why you can't do that. So, 
What, yeah. what was the, what did I learn in culinary school? You cook squid for seven seconds or seven hours. That's what, that's what I think that's what I heard. What I remember. One of the two, yeah. Yeah, one of the two. Um, and you can get it wrong somewhere in between there. Yes, there's a big <laughs> area where it can be wrong. Um, how far are you from the farm? Uh, so our farm's about 10 minutes away from the restaurant. Okay. Yeah, so it's a three acre farm. It's a, we've been building it for the last eight, eight years. So um now it's fully functioning about 600 beds on rotation oh, you know wow. it's uh there's enough there to support well, we do about sort of six and a half thousand people a year which okay, is wow. you know, yeah which is small amount compared to some larger restaurants but for us it's quite a lot you know mm -hmm. just fully sustainable from one farm so um from one area especially with rotations and all these types of things you need to do with crop rotations and we are trying to do a really diverse amount of plants and biodiversity is a strong point there for us so yeah there's a lot of like happenings going on all the time basically <laughs> yeah it sounds like it i mean as yeah. the chef and farmer you're having to juggle quite a bit between those two yes absolutely yeah and it um it does make for an interesting uh lifestyle for me <laughs> uh-huh uh -huh. <laughs> you got one one part of it you're uh, you're out there you know, trying to work out, you know, planting and digging up and planning for the next season and the next part of it, I'm standing there trying to plate the food and make sure it goes right out every night and those kinds of things. So, yeah. Um, but it has that, in all honesty, though, it's, it is um, it is uh, very challenging, but it's a beautiful thing to try and achieve, you know, each week in and week out. So, yeah, I'm curious how it's been for you to be challenging your guests' expectations um, around around meat. Um, yeah. You know, we were just talking to Narda. She's in Argentina, and there's this huge, yeah. uh, you know, tradition of of carnivory there. But um, yes. but also also where you are too, right? I mean, massively in Australia. Yeah, massively yeah. in our area, actually, where we are. Oh, really? Yeah, um, and we've had our issues in the past with it. Uh, when we first opened, we'll you know, we had people walk out that just looked at the menu and went, well, is there any steaks? Is there any, it's happened a lot actually with us wow. kind of like, where is the, this and that, and they just walk out. But we have over the last sort of eight years, we've adapted a, a, a basically a plan or a set of rules that we've given ourselves, not a set of rules, but a set of guidelines. Um, that is to only use what we grow from the farm vegetables, only use a supplier, of meat or seafood or someone that's within about an hour or two of us mm -hmm. locally from the area um, and also someone that we know personally and have to build a relationship with first before it goes onto the menu. And now we have got this sort of the way that we've sort of doing things at the moment is we, we're, we're only buying one cow every I actually own the cows as well. I take ownership of the cow. Oh, you do. I only use only use four cows a year for six thousand five hundred people. That's um, great. From that point, we use it through the whole cow. So we make a lot of preserves, salamis, pastrami's, um, all these types of things. But also use all of the the bones for jus and fat for uh, for seasoning and all these types of things. Um, so and then and then also seafood is is sourced locally and mm -hmm. so is our is our offcuts from the butcher across the road who gives us chicken bones and these types of things so yeah, yeah. that's sort of how we've achieved the and the menu and then the way the way in which we go about serving it and getting past the problem of people not eating meat right that's is by asking, yeah. us just educating 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 that this is this is the way that we do it sticking to our guns and you know continuing to do that all the time so yeah. yeah and i guess you know your business speaks for itself right i mean you've, you've you may have had some people walking out but you've certainly had enough people sorry coming I back I right uh-oh did we lose you maybe we're gonna work on figuring out some of these sound issues maybe in the meantime um yep. since blaine can hear me blaine we've got a few questions and i'm actually going to be selfish and ask the question that i had um which yep. ties on to um what joe was saying about you know you said you said that um or i was wondering if your diners respond more to the farm to table messaging rather than saying something like we serve less meat or we have you know we put vegetables first do you find that people sort of 
um, you know, think, oh, farm to table. Yes, that's something great. That's something interesting. That's something yeah. appealing without thinking about the reduction of meat that comes along with that. Yeah, I think um, that sort of, yeah, that setup actually makes makes a lot of sense. It does, that is probably our, our best way of going about it, is setting up a way where people already know that they're getting a predominant amount of farm vegetables. Like they're, they're, that, that expectation is already there in their mind. Um, so that also does very much help with the idea that you are going to get large amounts of vegetables uh, because it's all from our farm. So it does make, yeah, so that idea of farm to plate does create the uh, a very, uh, uh, sort of the, the, the way forward for the rest of the night is that people are already going to sort of understand that's what we're doing. Yeah, and then when we when we go through the menu, we just very subtly explain to people that we're, how we're trying to do it by using, you know, by using minimal amounts of meat, but also using sustainable methods and 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 farmers that that are also in tune in line with what we are and and also you know using the whole round the everything you could possibly do with a cow we're going to do to it to preserve it and make it last as much as we can yeah so um do make subtle hints and subtle movements through the through the night that that try to educate i guess and we we do actually try to con consciously educate our our, our guests um, we supply them with a whole range of sort of information, um, which we don't force down their throat, but we do give them the option. We use QR codes now. We use pamphlets that have our farm and our planting schedules and our suppliers and all these things. They don't have to read it. They don't have to do these things, but they, but it does part, it pulls the whole story together and that's what we're sort of trying to do. So, yeah. That is awesome. Um, and I'm going to play a little bit of telephone in a way here, unfortunately, since yeah. um, Blaine, yeah. you can't hear Joe, but we've still got Joe here. Um, yep. Joe, maybe for the sake of our audience, um, Joe, if you kind of want to talk about a point oh, sure. that you'd like to bring up for Blaine, and then I can I can reinterpret for Blaine. We're going to interpret from English. I'm going to speak Australian so that Blaine can understand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I yeah. was just I'm so struck by this cow arrangement. Sorry, the, was that the... a, was that a? <laughs> oh, sorry, Blaine. Yep, I'm just gonna. Um, I forgot that you can't hear Joe. Apologies to everyone no, out there. Okay. Do you want to turn the video on as well? I can... Yeah, okay. sure. So we've got um, um, Joe. You were you're saying about um, uh, yeah. cows yeah. and yeah. I'm so struck by this arrangement with the uh, four cows of year a year because I'm reminded of dishes that I've had um, that have made me a little bit frustrated because uh, they've they've used small amounts of many, many, many animals. So I'm thinking of the trend for a while that we had there of pig's ears, for instance, where there would be a whole platter of pig's ears as an appetizer. And when you think about it, it just doesn't make any sense to use something that comes from more than one animal, dozens and dozens of animals. Um, and then some other chef or chefs are having to um, use up all the rest where this is the exact opposite of that. So um, I'm just struck by that commitment to, uh, to low waste and curious if he does that with any other animals. Yeah, Blaine. So Joe is bringing up this question of, you know, when you've got, um, a dish with pig ears, which obviously, yeah. you know, you can only, uh, you need several pigs to have contributed their ears to kind of, yes. um, to create this dish as opposed to having one animal sort of um supply you know supply enough for a specific dish or across dishes um yep. do you have thoughts on that in terms of that use again going back to that use of that whole butchery and sort of working across your whole menu absolutely i think it's a great point it's pretty much the reason why we sort of moved away from where we were i think like five or six years ago which was using um just the scotch fillet essentially um mm. like we were using just one cut of meat that was amazing but using just just to achieve that you were using up sort of eight or so cows a week you know right um but for us to do what we're doing now just the one cow every 10 weeks and setting those rules and when we actually run out we run out we don't we don't serve meat after that or we serve oh wow you know that's that's our sort of 
challenge is to to achieve if it might be a beef ragout that we use in a small portion it'll be keeping bone, uh, meat on the bone dry aging it'll be doing all these things to get it through as far as we need um i think is way more important and way more challenging and for a chef and um it does go uh it does teach the industry and like the chefs who are coming through what i feel like is the most important way to cook and that mm-hmm. goes through not just cows, but also the way we deal with plants. Um, that's also needs to come into question as well. Um, we use a lot of the specific parts of plants and, and vegetables and we throw a lot of it out. So mm-hmm. um, we do the same thing with a lot of the things that we cook with. So um, we find that that attitude has to go right across the board with our menu. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense at all. Are there examples of this, of, of uh, vegetables where you really try to use up as much of them as possible in ways that maybe some of our listeners might not have thought of? Yeah, Blaine, in this last, um, we've got just a couple of minutes left. Joe is asking about your strategies for using vegetables um, that might be some inspiration for our attendees. Yeah, well, stra- like strategies for using vegetables is, um, is, is for us, it's based on on how much we grow, yield, all those types of things that come into play, especially for a restaurant like ours, using only what we do grow. Um, so uh, what we do is we we would look at our harvest and then decide from there if we've got a hell of a lot of stuff that came out of the ground we or you know that we harvested, we would, we would choose to either preserve a certain percentage of it, or we would run a course that would be able to sort of use it at its at its peak uh, fast enough. So. Um, and then there, there's the other option of giving it away to our mm. to our local community, which is what we do quite regularly. Um, friends and family, lots of my other restaurant friends, just give them boxes and boxes of zucchinis at the moment because I've got so many um, <laughs> tomatoes and all these things. So we, what we do with vegetables is is very much in line with what we're growing and what the season's offering, and um, very much living in the moment with with everything we do at our restaurant. Um, in that regard. So hopefully that answers that question, but. Yes, absolutely. Unfortunately, we are out of time, but thank you so much for joining us, Blaine. Um, I I should point out also to everybody that Blaine is joining us live from Australia. So it is basically the middle of the night that we have caught him here. (laughs) Maybe we're learning that internet is not so good at the middle of the night in Australia. But again, thank you so much, Blaine. Sorry about that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank Thanks you, for Blaine. working with us. Um, and Joe, um, unfortunately, we're out of time. But yep. since I co-opted, maybe just do you have 30 seconds to kind of um, to wrap up the session or any final thoughts for this? Oh, sure. Well, you know, I just I find both of them incredibly inspiring. And, um, you know, the amount of work and thought that goes into managing operations that are committed to to presenting plants in this way and to to using um, meats in this way is is really I think it's just so laudable um, and I hope that they're able to inspire some of our other um, watchers here to attempt some of the same techniques in their in their own kitchens. Just the ideas of of using meat as uh, flavoring and a garnish and really presenting the vegetable, um, kind of glorifying the vegetable is just something that I, I think is just key. I loved what Narda said about presenting a lot of the whole vegetables. So people like have this idea in their head about what they're, what they're having and what they ate. And also the idea of, um, cutting down on food waste is, is huge. Um, as many of our attendees know, it's, it's a, it's a major crisis and um, anything we can do to cut down on food waste is, is, is really important. So I was happy to be a part of it. Thank you very much. Thank you <laughs> so much, Joe, um, as well as our other presenters, Narda and Blaine Bertoncello. Um, you can continue the chat with Joe in his Meet the Author booth. We mentioned his uh, book, Cool Beans. That's going to be happening during our upcoming networking time. So feel free to head over there, chat more with Joe around his um, around his own travels and, um, and pursuits of plant-based and plant-forward food and eating for the climate.
Now that we've heard from some of our conference presenters, let's take a closer look at the poll feature that is on the right side of your screen. Some of you may have already found it. Actually, I know that some of you found it because I took a little glimpse. Um, you'll see that we're building on our first program session uh, to ask you, what do you think is the most effective strategy for enticing heavy meat eaters with more plant forward dishes? I wonder if your um, responses have changed over the course of seeing these sessions. I think we've got some amazing ideas from the chefs. Uh, it looks like currently most, oh, this seems very appropriate. Most people are saying that using global recipes and flavors that are traditionally plant forward, um, they think that's the most effective strategy. It looks like blending meat with vegetables and legumes, as well as making meat a side dish or just to add a bit of flavor to finish dish. We definitely saw that in these past demos. Um, those are also in the running. So please let us know what you think over in the poll section. And now I'm delighted to welcome to the stage uh, somebody who is no stranger to Joe Yonin either, Jane Black, who will be moderating our fireside chat with chef Eric Repair. Jane is a Washington, D.C.-based food writer whose work regularly appears in the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, and the New York Times. And she was one of the insightful voices on our media panel at last year's summit, talking about how the media cover plant-forward developments. Um, and of course, she's going to be moderating this conversation with Chef Eric Repair. I'll let um, Jane, you introduce uh, Chef Repair, but welcome to both of you. Thank you very much. Um, well, that is the easiest job they've given me all day is introducing Chef Eric Repair because it's a complete cliche, but he needs no introduction. Um, he's the chef at uh, and owner of Le Bernardin in New York. And you would expect if we had him on probably most of the other panels he's been dragged onto in his life, it would be about seafood. But obviously today we're talking about vegetables because he has a lot to say about vegetables, but also because he has a wonderful new cookbook out, um, which we'll be doing some talking about. So I'm gonna get right into it. Um, so vegetables, you, probably everyone says, oh, he's the seafood guy, right? So, but you have been having a vegetarian tasting menu at Le Bernardin since 2016. So tell me a little bit about how that came about. Good afternoon, uh, Jane, and good afternoon, everyone. And yes, at Le Bernardin, we have a vegetable uh, menu since 2016. And it came about because we had a lot of people asking for it. And a lot of people would come to Le Bernardin and surprise us at the la at very last minute and say, by the way, um, I'm vegetarian or I'm vegan, or I just want to have a different experience. Are, do you have some vegetable recipes and each time it happened we didn't have really a menu in place so we will improvise and do the best we we could and i think we were doing a good job obviously i'm biased <laughs> however I, I just wanted to really have a, a menu that pay homage to the season and the, especially the vegetables and we created a testing menu uh, in 2016 and since it has been uh, a very big success Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, one of the things that I think is interesting about vegetables um, in, in restaurants and, and I'm, maybe is that, you know, people feel that they need to justify it somehow. It has to be crazy fancy in order to be okay to be a vegetable dish, unless you're at a vegetarian restaurant. Um, but one of the things that you write in the new book is that, you know, fish requires a great deal of focus and technical skill in a way that enhances rather than hides its essential qualities. And I'm wondering if you think that that is the same with vegetables. And then secondly, whether that's harder to do because people expect you to gussy it up somehow. Mm. So at Le Bernardin, we have um, we have a mantra uh, that basically dictate our style, and the mantra says the fish is the star of the plate because Le Bernardin is a seafood restaurant, and therefore when when you have such a direction, such a philosophy, whatever goes into the plates, I'm talking about the sauce and. Uh, the garnish that goes with the fish is to enhance the qualities of that species. And every fish is different and, and needs a different um, techniques to be, to be elevated. 
And obviously, you can uh, apply the same technique to meat, but certainly vegetables. Uh, when you say the artichoke is the star of the plate, or if you say the celeriac is going to be the star of the plate, you apply exactly the same reasoning. So mm -hmm. you say, what, what is going to enhance, what is going to make the artichoke taste better than just having a, a, an artichoke with, with no preparation, really? And uh, we, we are doing that with every dish that we are serving on our menu. And uh, that philosophy works really well. And I think it's the, it's the right approach to it because you really focus on the product. You don't necessarily care on the beginning of the process about presentation and colors and texture. You just care about making it better. And then everything else comes into place mm -hmm. during the process. I wonder if you could give me an example of that for one of the vegetable dishes that you have put on the menu and tell me just a little bit about the process of of figuring out how to make that the star sure um so artich we're going to take the, uh, the the artichoke example since um it's the spring coming up and and they are uh definitely coming in in season so the artichoke is a is a vegetable that is very delicate as we know it has it has um the leaves that are very uh, tough and, and you do not eat the, eat the leaves, but the heart of the artichoke, it's something that is very fragile in terms of texture. Um, if you overcook it, it, it breaks and, and it's mushy and it's not good. If you don't overcook it and it's not cooked enough, potentially it will oxidize the heart of the artichoke I'm talking about, become uh, dark, the flavor will not be as, as delicate. Um, so what, what we did is we basically try different techniques of cooking the artichoke. And at the, at the end, I said, you know, I think for large artichokes, the best way to cook them is to uh, uh, basically poach them in, in water and salt, a bit of olive oil, and a tiny, tiny bit of lemon, because we don't want to really feel the acidity of it. Mm -hmm. And then we are going to present that artichoke uh, on our menu in a beautiful way. So we, we created um, uh, basically like a, a fan made of artichoke. It's like, it's like almost like looking like a flower. Hmm. And um, truffles, black truffles go really well with artichokes for some reason. So we, we decided to, to, to do a, a black truffle a vinaigrette that is not, again, too aggressive. Mm -hmm. And the artichoke and the and the truffles really um, love to be together for some reason. And to bring a bit of richness, we in the center of the plate added um, a bit of risotto, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that was the homage that we paid to the artichoke that, that was on our. Uh, it, it sounds like it's a lot of work that goes into every dish, and, and I'm and I'm sure that that's the case at Le Bernardin, and, and that's what people expect. But I wonder, you know, if you could talk for the other chefs and restaurateurs in the audience about sort of, um, I guess, the sort of the whole R&D that was involved in adding a vegetarian menu to your restaurant. It isn't just, you know, let's just add a couple of dishes like what what was the what was the whole process and 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 i guess the quest i guess is that the same process you think everyone should apply to kind of looking at a vegetables or was it a special case given that you're a seafood known as a seafood restaurant sure um so in terms of r d what what we did first we we said well if we are going to have vegetables on our menu is it has to be seasonal we are not going to serve tomatoes in January and have um, butternut squash in August. It doesn't really make sense. And um, we started to go to markets in, in New York and we have a couple of very nice markets, Union Square being the most famous in the city, but we have some other ones. It's a big one on the Upper West Side and so on. And we work also with our farmers, local farmers that deliver to Le Bernardin and we say to them, what is best in season right now? What can you send, uh, send us as, as a sample so we can start to work on it? And we receive a lot of vegetables. We went and, and shopped for a lot of them as well. And um, then we, we 
decided to uh, take them one by one and and define what are the qualities of those those different ingredients, different vegetables. So I was mentioning before the, the artichoke. Some some other vegetables we know they are a bit sweet. Some oh, vegetables are uh, starchy. Some ve vegetables um, are floral and, and, and so on. Depending of what we we found, we then apply the mantra, right? So the for instance. Uh, the cauliflower is the star of the plate, and so on. And and we uh, d again use different techniques to see what was best to elevate the qualities of that main ingredient. And then we um, we find some other ingredients that were in season and created dishes that were really um, in the moment. Right. I mean, we just got a question from the audience, which I think is a good one, which is, you know, about what percentage of the daily covers in the restaurant opt for that vegetable menu now? So it's it's small compared to the, the amount of clients. It's about 15% of the, of the clientele ask for the vegetable menu, uh, which is, I think it's pretty good. Yeah, I think it's really good. It's, yes. it's wonderful. It no. I'm sorry. What is interesting is that on the beginning, we had a lot of people who came and said, you know, I'm a veg vegetarian because of my spirituality, uh, uh, because of my religion, and I couldn't uh, come to your restaurant before. And then we, we started to see people coming and saying, hey, by the way, I, I heard or I, I read that you have a vegetable menu. I'm here for... Um, testing them. I'm here for pleasure. I I have no restrictions. I'm just here because I want to try to have an experience. Yeah, that's exciting. Yes. And, and you know, you mentioned the, the for spiritual reasons, we just got, I have a question on my list and we just got another question from the audience, which is the same one, which is, you know, I'm curious how your Buddhism or uh, philosophies, you know, and your experience has impacted your philosophies towards plant forward cooking. Is that been a driver for you? Yes, it has been a driver for me, but I will certainly not impose on the team and on the clientele my my religious beliefs. Uh, I will not do that. However, it has been for me um, not a revelation, but Buddhism has been a huge influence in my life. Mm -hmm. And although I am not a vegetarian, and I, I eat uh, meat and fish. I, I eat much more uh, vegetables today than I, I ever did in my life. And I actually realized that um, I feel really good about it mm -hmm. in terms of health, of course. I feel very good uh, about it uh, because I'm, I know I'm uh, helping the planet in many ways by, by doing so. And also I'm thinking about um, animals, especially, especially in factory farms that are suffering. So that makes me feel good as well. Uh, right. And uh, it, it's definitely um, a motivation to, to do so, to bring vegetables more and more. I think this is one of the, and this is not a question we had discussed previously, but I'm just thinking about cook, my own cooking. I, I also eat you know, some meat and would prefer to eat, lower that even more. But I find it's a lot of work to make vegetables. I mean, not even just, it's not a question of making them taste good. It's just a lot of work. I think it's sort of people underestimate how much peeling and chopping and prepping and that kind of thing is. And that it's easier for them to just grill the steak or, you know, bake the fish or do whatever it is. And then do one vegetable, then kind of have a whole composed, like thoughtful meal. Is that just in your mind as an expert cook just out of habit that it seems easier to us or do you think it might maybe actually is a little bit more work i don't think it's more, more work at all uh, i think the mindset of professionals and a lot of people in their house who like to cook was to say okay uh, i'm going to make a roasted chicken and then uh, well, what am i going to put with that roasted chicken right. and the afterthought was like Oh, but yeah, well, we're going to put some vegetables. Let's see what we have. And, um, and, and it was going in a dish. Um, th that mentality is, is changing. Right. Now, cooking vegetables can be uh, labor-intensive, can be also very technical. And um, 
but it can it can also be very simple and it's why i came up with the book vegetable simple right out on, on april 20. yeah i mean it's um well, I will talk about the book in a minute, but you know, one of the things that you, the recipes in the book in a minute, but one of the things that you say in the introduction is that some of the inspiration that you had for these recipes and for the recipes you cook come from growing up in Provence. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about those inspirations and maybe other inspirations for maybe a particular dish that you either have on the menu. I don't know what the <laughs> what the state of the menu is these days or or pre-pandemic times. Yes. Um, so I grew up in in the French French Riviera in Provence and in the south of France mostly, where herbs and vegetables are are really uh, everywhere and, and uh, it's a little bit like the California of France. Mm -hmm. And uh, in our diet, in my family diet, we used to eat a lot of vegetables and very little fish and very little meat. Fish was more uh, traditionally served on Friday mm -hmm. and meat was mostly uh, a Sunday item. Uh, you had a roasted chicken or leg of lamb and the family was was gathering around around that dish and uh, it was like a Sunday dish. And then if you had leftover, of course, you, you will go into, into the week with it. But most of the time during the week, we were eating a lot of different preparations uh, with vegetables. And again, they didn't require too much time to be prepared, didn't require too much technique. My, my mother and my aunts and grandmothers didn't have to spend the entire day cooking the meal because they, they were busy doing other things. Right, right. But what, so was there a dish you grew up eating there that has its elite version on the Lavernadam menu? So the, the, the pesto soup that we, that we used to eat sometimes, uh, that has uh, a lot of different vegetables from the South, which is, tomatoes and string beans uh, and zucchinis and white beans. Um, and it's basically cooked together. The cut in dice is cooked together. And uh, at the end of at the end, you, you mix them with a puree of garlic and uh, basil and olive oil that binds the soup together. That was a soup, but it was also kind of like an appetizer. It was really like more than a soup. Uh, mm. yeah, it was filled with vegetables. And uh, the day after, we were eating that as a salad too. And it was it was um, delicious as well, uh, served cold. So that that is a dish that I remember all the time because the flavors were so vibrant. You could smell it from far away and you were right. excited to to eat that, that dish. I'm curious, what do you think it is going to take to move the industry as a whole in a more plant forward direction? Or what lessons or what, what advice would you, two things, what will it take and what advice would you give to help it move in that direction? Well, I think it's very important not to be preachy and not to impose on people um, your views. I think it's very, it's very important to inspire. It's much more powerful. Uh, so inspiring means potentially uh, having a vegetable menu like we have at, at Le Bernardin or creating a book that people may find interesting and may want to um, use and then appreciate uh, the recipes and, and, and discover that vegetables are, are really delicious. Uh, it's about being with you and, and talking about vegetables uh, and and communicating with the media and so on. I think this is what will bring changes in the habit of, of everyone. Right. Uh, it, it, yeah, I think it's also a question of like really sort of m making it not feel like a sacrifice, make, knowing that it's a joyful thing. And, yes. you know, I mentioned this book. I, I, I encourage everybody to, to get this book. But the photos in this book are glorious. I mean, they look like artwork. And if you saw that on your plate, you wouldn't think you were sacrificing anything. I'm wondering if that was sort of part of the thought of this very beautiful, almost abstract photography in the book. The, the art in the book, so the pictures are from a, a friend of mine. His name is Nigel Perry. He's, 
is very famous for being a portrait photographer and he has done all the celebrities in the world and made many covers of the New York Sunday Time magazine and and Esquire magazine and Newsweek and so on. And I asked him if he was interested to take pictures of vegetables. And he said, take a picture of a sweet potato, say. And he, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and he said, yes, I'm going to take portraits of vegetables. And, uh, and yes, some of the pictures are a little bit abstract, but we mainly focus on, again, with the pictures, making the vegetables look beautiful and appetizing, right? Mm -hmm. that, that was the, the, the work um, that we did with Nigel. Yeah, this is a sort of a different variety. I mean, we, we just talked about this, but we just had a question come in from the audience that I want to ask you, which is that, you know, vegetables are often perceived by consumers as cheaper than other protein or than proteins. And so how do you add that value to the plant-based dishes so that they're perceived as upscale? I mean, I'm assuming presentation is one, but tell me what you think about that. Well, I think protein actually, especially in America, are very inexpensive. When you think about uh, chicken, uh, right. or I mean, even if you go to fast food, it's so it's so inexpensive to eat meat. Uh, vegetables, some of them can be inexpensive, and some of them can be uh, definitely not not uh, cheap uh, at, at all uh, if you if you buy some right now is the season some very large green asparagus or, or even white asparagus the price print can be uh, quite significant and uh, and therefore uh, you have to uh, really treat them with a lot of respect uh, it doesn't mean that it's complicated but um, you right. treat them with a lot of respect you pay homage to them again and if you do that well, people will have really, again, some fantastic experience. Yeah, I think it's just a hangover though, isn't it? They just think, oh, you're feeding me vegetables, it must be inexpensive. It's sort of, again, just sort of a, a slow change of mindset. Yeah, vegetables are not, I mean, like mushrooms are not, are, are, are not inexpensive at all when you right. think about it. Right. Um, now, one of the most expensive food on the planet is truffles white or black <laughs> right. <laughs> right all right i'm going to try to sneak two more questions in before we go um yeah. one is sort of an industry question um and which is really about you know what kind of training do you think we need to sort of give chefs and other people in the hospitality world about pushing or or educating on plant forward menus well, besides this wonderful conference <laughs> yes of course <laughs> Um, I think, f first of all, for people who are coming into our industry, they have to be well educated. And obviously, culinary schools uh, bring a lot of um, diverse education, uh, and, and it's very important. Then, those young professionals have to train in kitchens and see really if they like um, the world of the of of being in a restaurant and being in hospitality business. And what we are looking for, we are looking for people who are team players, hardworking uh, workers, passionate about what they do, um, clean, obviously, <laughs> organized and, 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 and so on. And then in terms of inspiring those cooks to um, work with vegetables, this comes a bit later on. On the beginning, they have to master the techniques, which takes quite some time. They have to have a good understanding of uh, different styles of cooking from different chefs and so on. And then when they have a certain experience, finally, they can express themselves. And uh, I'm, I'm talking about the restaurant at home. They can do that in, any day they want. Uh, but um, when they have that knowledge, then finally, they can, they can uh, tackle... Uh, any ingredient and and some make something delicious and beautiful. Right. Okay, so my last question is about, I suppose it's what the next it vegetable is. So one of the things that you've done in your career is take sort of underutilized or under what less well-known seafood and, and really make it a star and get people to know what it was. So are there any vegetables out there 
that are unloved and under underappreciated that that you are either going to make the next star or you predict could or should be what's our next vegetable star that's a very tricky question right <laughs> the question comes every year usually what what's the next trend what is what i find interesting is that most of the time the next very popular vegetable it's something that is very inexpensive mm -hmm. that is usually a staple that is overlooked and then suddenly you have a chef or someone who, who's very talented that does something with it that inspire inspire everyone to to use it and i can refer to my mentor joel robuchon who in the 80s took a very humble vegetable a potato and made the most famous and probably expensive mashed potato in the world. Right. And and um, to his dismay, he became um, the specialist of the mashed potato. He, he wanted to be. <laughs> he wanted to have a different legacy, but he created that. So I I I would say it could be white beans. It could be lentils. It could be a grain. It could be uh, something that again is is in. In your garden or at, at the store and that we overlook today and then suddenly it's it's gonna pop up and right. and be everywhere like kales yes exactly or brussels sprouts i feel like that's a really wonderful note to end on because it, it makes us look at the things that we're not we're forgetting to pay attention to and look at them with a fresh eye and bring some creativity to them and inspire as chef repair has done in his book and at his restaurants and to all of us in the industry and I'll pass it back to Jackie. Thank you so much, Jane, and thank you to Chef Repair as well. Um, we're out of time for this session, but the conversation isn't over. Chef Repair will be taking more questions in his Meet the Author booth during this upcoming networking time, um, where we will have links for you to pre-order his book as well so that you can get recipes. Before I go over all of the awesome activities we have going on in the platform, let's continue the global tour of Plant Forward Inspiration with this trailer from the Israel edition of the Unilever World Culinary Arts Series. And thanks to our partnership with Unilever Food Solutions, this series will continue to expand in the future with even more focus on global plant-forward culinary innovation. Check out the link in the chat to see the full set of videos from their trip to Israel. So enjoy this first networking time sponsored by the National Peanut Board, followed by a short program intermission. And then you won't want to miss our next general session where we'll be taking a look at making plant-forward menus destination worthy from the Medina of Marrakech to the Mendocino coast of California. We'll see you all back here at 1215 Pacific at 315 Eastern.